Hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism, a podcast asking the question, what does it mean to be fully alive in the 21st century? And how do we best maintain that aliveness while dealing with the unique stressors of this really strange and potent time? I'm your host, Brett Kane. I'm a licensed massage therapist and mindfulness meditation instructor, and my intention with the show is to have a multidisciplinary conversation which brings in people from many different fields and practices and worldviews and brings them all under the umbrella to explore what exactly we need to take into consideration in order to really be at the edge of our aliveness and really make the most out of this human experience that we're having. So today, to help me explore this really rich and diverse conversation, we have an incredible guest that I am very, very honored to share with you. Her name is Molly Lannon-Kenny. She's a teacher, therapist, lecturer, and writer who has spent over 30 years dedicating her life to individual transformation and radical social change. Uh, Back in 2001, she founded the Samaria Center for Integrated Movement Therapy and Ashtanga Yoga, which focuses on deep spiritual inquiry, social justice, yoga as therapy, and a whole slew of other offerings, including yoga for grief and loss and end-of-life care. This is what we're going to be focusing on today. When Samaria closed in 2015, Molly ended up moving out to Mexico where she founded the La Ermita, which is a contemplative community that offers meditation, therapy, and both in-person and online classes. So a big chunk of what Molly has to offer is something called bedside yoga, which is this really beautiful um, practice of bringing yoga to people who are at the end of their lives, people who are in the actual dying process, and how to really bring your presence and your spaciousness into these spaces and how to provide relief uh, for people suffering or the best approximation that we can. Uh, So this is a very important conversation. This is one that I've been wanting to have on the show for a very long time. And it's one that I think is Uh, really crucial and foundational to this conversation of cultivating aliveness. I think a big part of that is really, really yoking the idea that we are going to die. We are definitely on a limited time span here on this earth. And I really think that by engaging with this energy that is very natural and oftentimes misunderstood, I think it really has a potential to supercharge our practices and to really lead us down a path towards cultivating a real grounded sense of compassion, not just as a personality trait, but as something that you actively do. So in this conversation, we talk about the difficulty in talking about death. We talk about what it's like to be in the presence of death, how we can best be with grief in ourselves and with others. We talk about what exactly the tender heart of compassion is and how death can bring us closer to life. And we spend a lot of time about how yoga can actually be brought into these spaces. And uh, just as a spoiler, it's not necessarily just the asanas or the poses, but there's a whole lot of other things in yoga which often get overlooked in our really modern world. So this is a really, really important and frankly beautiful conversation. Maybe one of my favorites that I've had on the podcast, if I'm being honest. Molly is incredibly wise and skillful in her ability to communicate and to share her insight into this often um, avoided concept and world. So I am nothing but thankful and grateful for her time. She is going to be starting a end-of-life bedside yoga care class, and that's going to be starting on April 12th. So hopefully this is getting to you in time. If you're interested in something like that, head on over to mollylannonkenny.org. That all those links are going to be in the description as well. And that is spelled as it is in the episode title. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, y'all. It's really a beautiful, beautiful conversation that I think is needs to be broadcasted as much as possible. So if you find some benefit from this, if you know anybody who's going through grief, please feel free to share this episode and maybe any of the other ones for the relevant people in your life. If you really want to support this show beyond that, you can follow, like, subscribe, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all those things. Stay up to date with the show as episodes release. We also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash 21st Century Vitalism. That is 
um, for people who are really passionate about this show as much as I am because I almost feel like a fan as well with everyone that I'm talking to. So if you want to see this really um, grow into its teenage years where we can really start to pump in more and more energy, please consider donating some of your uh, financial resources. It really helps keep the lights on, so to speak. We also have Apple Podcasts. If you want to leave us a review, that really helps as well. It's the gold standard for podcast reviews. And please um, give Molly some of your attention beyond this uh, this conversation, this episode on her website. She's got a really amazing blog that explores a lot of rich and important conversations on end of life care and yoga as a whole. You know, she goes beyond that. She's a very well rounded teacher. So I really encourage you to plug in and see what she has going on because she's, she's a badass for sure. So that's what we're going to be doing today, y'all. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Let me know in the comments or whatever you're doing. Just let me know. How, how, how am I doing? How are you feeling about where we are so far? I'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, please sit back, do some stretches, drink some tea, and most importantly, open your heart for Molly Landon Kenny. All right, we are now live. Molly, hello, and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so just a little preface for the listeners, and I did kind of briefly catch you up on this, but I recently found your platform by asking my massage therapy teacher, how can I possibly get into hospice work? What do I need to learn to bring my massage to this specific population? And I don't know how she got connected with you, but she sent me your website and I spent some time with your offerings and went through a bunch of your blog posts and left feeling really inspired. And Mm -hmm. it really made me want to reach out to you, which you um, luckily replied and we organized this. And something I think is really important is having the conversation that you are creating with your practice. And it's something I've wanted on my show for a really long time, because I think the question of how do we maintain aliveness, I think requires us to really look more fully at death. And I just wanted to start by asking, why do you think it's so hard for this people to have this conversation. I feel like it's often like really kept under wraps and just kind of like hush, hush. We don't talk about it until we have to face it. And then we like don't have the tools to actually face it. And it's even more difficult. So why do you think that it is hard for people to talk about this? I think there's a lot of reasons that the very first thing that comes to my mind is a quote that I often repeat from Larry Ward. I don't know if you are familiar with Larry Ward and the Lotus Institute. He is a senior Dharma teacher with Thich Nhat Hanh, um, an incredible, incredible Buddhist teacher. Um, and on a ret- retreat with him one time, he said, self-cherishing is a natural response to being alive. And I've quoted that so many times, right? So one is that this is the only thing that we know, this, our physical body. And so for us to conceive of the fact that we are going to leave it or that people we love are going to leave this planet, leave our lives, it's, it's both like emotionally untenable, but also just even at a brain level, it's like, it sort of doesn't compute, right? This is all that we know. And so that self-cherishing, right? We just, we want this. So that's one part. I think that that's one aspect of it. Um, I think another aspect is um, that we, that we're really trained that talking, talking about death it well actually i'm thinking two things one is that it's almost like it's it's like a superstition like if i talk about it then it's going to happen if i say that someone's going to die then that's going to happen if i acknowledge that my parents are going to die that somehow i'm expediting that so i think there's like a piece of that but we've also really been trained that it's like somehow rude or or icky or morbid like in the same way we're not supposed to you know ask people about their age or you know their their money or something like that, um, that it's somehow it's like off to be talking about death and dying. So I think it's just part of our, um, our cultural conditioning that this is, 
this is a topic. So I guess I'm saying internally, we don't talk about it because we can't really face it. And that's even in uh, like in Patanjali's yoga sutra, right? Abhinavesha, one of the kleshas. And then uh, from our external conditioning that it's just like, it's not, it's not table talk. It's not pleasant talk. So I think that's, yeah. that's why as well. It's really interesting, even as you were describing that, as you said, like talk about my parents dying, like I felt something within my body where it like, it like kind of tensed up a little bit. And as somebody who's even like open to the conversation, like it's within our like physiology that we like have this hardening response, which I mean, it is such a vulnerable con conversation. So I could see why it wouldn't be table talk. So I'm kind of curious for you, when did you kind of get the insight? You've been a yogi for a, a minute now. Uh, was that always kind of infused with this um, direction towards it? Or is this something that kind of came later? No, it came later. Um, is this a good time for me to tell my, my story? Yeah, briefly? Yeah, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so um, I was a clinician working in a hospital and just starting to kind of get into yoga a little bit and just started to see a lot of the things that I was doing clinically that seemed like they could be done better if I brought in some of the aspects that I was learning from my yoga practice at the same time. And so that's kind of all I'll say about that. So I, I started to develop a therapy method while I was still in the clinical setting called integrated movement therapy, which was bringing um, some of the practices and principles of yoga into a clinical setting, into a therapeutic setting. And so I left the hospital to pursue that and to develop that therapy method. And I opened a place up in Seattle called the Samaria Center. Um, it was the first nonprofit yoga center in the Northwest. It was the first therapy, like um, yoga therapy center. It was the first social justice center. It was the first um, like radically inclusive kind of radical progressive yoga center. Um, it's just an incredible, incredible thing. So I opened that really to have a place to start practicing integrated movement therapy and starting to bring clients there and being able to practice not in the confines of the hospital. But as I had that space, I'm very dedicated to service. So I started uh, creating different kinds of service programs. So by the time I left there, almost 16 years later, we had over 30 different volunteer outreach programs putting yoga into different kinds of settings. So during that time of development, one of my students who was an Ashtanga student um, lost a pregnancy and but late, late, like seven or eight months. And she was in her grief response and she wrote to me and asked if I could um, connect with her. And by connecting with her, even as a clinician, I hadn't really done grief work. Um, but connecting with her, I just really started to understand and think about and sort of unpack grief and also what the yoga practice and yoga philosophy might be in order to help people through grief. So from that, then I started a program called life after loss. That was all about grief and grief recovery. Um, did that for a couple of years. And then because we had all these outreach programs, somebody said to me, well, why, why don't we start an outreach program for people who are dying? And I was like, geez, I don't know. Like, okay. Like, how would we do that? But I'm just like, I told you, I say yes to everything. So I was like, oh, yeah, all right, we'll make that happen. Uh, so we went in and we pitched the program to a place in Seattle that um, is an end of life. It, it's not technically a hospice, but it has 33 beds and about one third of the people die there. Everyone is critically ill who is in this particular facility. So I pitched the facility there, or, excuse me, the program there. And, and I will say that he said that he had had other yoga people sort of pitch this idea of bringing yoga in, but he had turned everybody down because it seemed like there wasn't, there wasn't sort of the clinical piece as well. There wasn't this depth or really understanding what it is you're going to be seeing and looking at when you're talking about people that are in such a delicate state. So uh, when I went in there, we just, it was, it was just random. We called it bedside yoga and we had really no idea what we were going to do. Um, we just were like, we'll just see how this works. I will say that from the very beginning, because of my, because of the development of integrated movement therapy, whenever I said the word yoga, I never have equated it with yoga asana, even though my intro into yoga was Ashtanga which is like only asana because you don't learn anything else. There's no philosophy. There's no talk. You just go and you do your practice. So um, 
So we began to uh, develop this program in the hospital, in the, in the facility. So as I was doing that, then more, my students knew I was doing that or friends knew I was doing that. So then people would start to ask me, they'd say, my mom's dying. Can you help me? My girlfriend's dying. Can you help me? And so I just started to go into more and more homes and um, hospital rooms that weren't related to the program that I had and just supporting people and, and getting more insight that way. Um, and then in 2018, my sister was diagnosed with a really rare and aggressive form of cancer. And, um, she already knew that I did this work and she was like, wow, well now you're going to be doing this work with me. And, um, and so that was, you know, intense. And, and she was really like, you should do trainings and retreats. You should teach people this Molly. You should let people know what you're doing. And now you're working with me and you have this other insight and what have you. So, um, I started to do retreats and, um, trainings and while she was still alive. And then I took care of her through her process, through her illness and then in her death and then after her death. And I always share when I tell this story, because it's an important thing for people to recognize too, the options that um, I actually, I actually buried my sister with my own hands. Like I literally put her body into the ground and then I, with my hands, with dirt and leaves, I buried her. Um, that was a profound experience, obviously. Um, and so continued to do retreat and then the pandemic hit. And, and so I was like, well, I guess I just have to pause on all of the retreats. And then I paused and I paused and I thought, you can't put this stuff online. There's no way. And then the, the pandemic kept going. And then I thought, well, yeah, I better put it online. Everybody's putting stuff online. So I transferred the training to online. And honestly, it's the best thing I ever did because the amount of content I can give, the accessibility that I can give um, is, is unmatched. I, I couldn't do it in a retreat setting. So during that time, I, I would draw a lot on my background, my professional experience, a lot of my yoga experience, but I would talk a lot about Erin and, and her death and that process and all the things I learned by actually being the intimate partner instead of just a supporter. And I had a lot of chaplains on my various trainings, and a couple of the chaplains worked with traumatic death, and people would ask questions about traumatic death, and I would say, well, I don't really know about that because... Um, because by definition, end of life care, you're not going to be there for a traumatic death. Um, and I would say, but I suppose there would be a lot of the same kinds of things. Um, and we, so we would try, try to fold that in. And so actually on November 9th of this year, I was in the very couple of last days of one of my online trainings and my little brother was killed in a swimming accident um, while I was actually on, on teaching a class. Este. And so, um, yeah, that was only four months ago, less than four months ago. Um, and, but I didn't really stop teaching. And what I have been able to glean from that is then even more about how the same conversations about shepherding, stewarding, and accompanying someone through end of life really are so many of the same conversations about supporting someone after a traumatic death. And then also being able to see not only from a clinical perspective of having been a therapist and work with grief extensively, and then also watching, seeing firsthand the qualitative differences of grief around a grief that you're grieving a long time and then the person dies and you're continuing with your grief from traumatic grief that you had no idea was coming. And, um, and so I continue to learn a lot, um, and then to share a lot and to just use all of this loss and, um, all of my own personal experience, you know, layered on my professional experience and on my yoga experience to, to offer this kind of work and offer this kind of training. And now, honestly, I can pretty much say, I just, I feel unmatched <laughs> Uh, it's not it's not experience I would want, but I feel unmatched in my capacity to talk about the entire spectrum of this. So that's my story. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, I am really sorry about last November. And that's very fresh. That's 
amazing that you're able to integrate this and already are focusing on turning that into like fertile soil to help other people. That's a really inspiring way to navigate something like this. So uh, if I had a hat, I would be <laughs> tipping it to you. With a lot of people who are hearing this, um, I mean, you've obviously been doing this work for uh, a long time. Some people have never even been really in the presence of death. Um, what was that like for you when you first began working with people in that process? Like, do you remember, you don't have to name a name, but when you were working with somebody, not just the, um, uh, the student, but when you were actually in the room with somebody who's, who's passing, do you remember what that space was like? Like what insights that you had or kind of like, was there like a big realization moment? I just, I've never been around it. So I'm also asking for personal experience, mm -hmm. just what that, what is that energy? What is that space? Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, so some of it I can say really in retrospect, sort of hindsight is twenty twenty. So I, I would say one thing is that it is a very holy space. It is a very, what people might call a liminal space or a thin space. It is a very sacred space. Um, it is a space that sort of catapults us out of time and out of, like out of this reality. Like it's so real. I mean, it's so real that it becomes even that your own everyday life all of a sudden even feels less real. And I'll talk about that often as being one of the, the, the awful gifts of grief. But if we have to have it, we can accept that great gift too, that we do have this period of time where we really know like what's what and, and what matters and what doesn't. There's a, there's a clarity that I think is really um, extraordinary in that, in that space. Um, so I would say generally there, there's that um, on sort of more practical sides um, the what, what it can look like at the end. Um, like I can think of two in particular that are both in my mind. Like one was a scheduled death where um, a woman had, she had already gathered everybody around her and she had gathered the people that she wanted there and she had the dress that she wanted to put on. Um, and she had um, a, like a Buddhist, um, like a monk who was chanting from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. She had identified music that she wanted to be played and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so we were all in her room and then, um, you know, talking to her and, connecting with one another. And then she pretty much said, okay, I'm ready. And then the nurses came in and said, okay, well, you know, we're going to start turning down her oxygen. Um, and so it's going to be this process and you're just basically going to watch her die and we're all going to be here together. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, that was a very beautiful death. I think one of the things I didn't realize, I'm, I'm really just memorizing, me remembering this now that everybody wanted to like touch her. And there were so many people in the room that they started touching each other. Right. So everybody was like touching someone, even though we didn't all know each other. Um, and I just have a really strong, I have a very strong visual image of that. And, and as I'm thinking, it's just so interesting now because having been through, now, especially the death of my sister, um, because that was something that we knew was coming, how much this feeling of just wanting to have physical human touch um, was so powerful and that um, like even as a grieving person that I wanted people like touching me, but not hugging. I didn't want people coming up and hugging me. It wasn't that. So I can give that hint. But just to feel there's like an aliveness and a connection um, really seems to be something that we as human beings, like we know to do from like a primal space. Like we know to touch other humans and be like, we're, we're okay. We're alive. We're letting go. And then I'm thinking that as being the exact opposite to another death that I was called into, um, where the woman had no family there. Uh, she was really in and out of consciousness. She, um, was very scared and um, anxious and calling out. And, and that's actually why the facility called me. They were like, someone's got to come down here and accompany her. She's just like all over the place. So that was a really different situation. Um, it was just me and her in the room. And I just, you know, kind of hung out with her as she, 
you know, did her process. Um, and in that, that was really a situation where I had to just really trust that whatever I could offer her through my presence as another human being, that she was connecting with that on a subconscious, semi-conscious level, and that she knew that she was safe and not alone. Um, and then also someone cared enough to be in her room because there was no family or anything else. So, I mean, they, they, they can look really different and they'll require different things of us as the person who's willing to, to go and do that. Hmm. Do you find as somebody who engages in this work that the more that you interact with it, the more ease you find by showing up for people? Do you think that there's, it's just as fresh as it always is every time and does it, it just get, does it get easier the more you kind of deal with it? Yes, absolutely. It does. Um, so one is because of just experiencing it. Like you've seen it before, you know, it, you've done it. Um, and, um, and then also because of the, it's because of the work I do, um, like the inner work that I do as well. So one of the things I talk about a lot in my training is the idea of decoupling death and dying from grief and loss. And so I do a lot of inner work and in my training, I do a lot of work around being able to be okay with the naturalness of death and that we have this false belief that what is natural is um, that somebody, you know, lives to be 97 years old and then they never have dementia or anything and then they fall asleep and they, they die in their sleep and that's beautiful and, you know, that's great when that happens. But we've, we, uh, like what you said in the beginning, we talk so little about it that we really have been like brought into this idea that this should be the way that we die and anything that's outside of that is just so wrong. Um, and, and that in fact, what we have to become more and more comfortable with is that the manner and the cause and the timing of death is just, it's just, is what it is. And we're all going to die. And some of us are going to die in a swimming accident. Some of us are going to die, you know, through cancer. Some of us are going to die when we're two months old. And right. So, and, that, and it's just, that's just going to happen. And so I need to be able to be in a place where I can, I can really feel the truth of that, that that was always going to be so. And so I can stay solid. It's like I can keep my ship steering right because if I keep being like they're dying and it was so wrong and it was so wrong and it, 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 it just creates this whole other narrative that makes the grief like less pure, less able to just rest in the grief and without the complication of like, if only it would have been this other thing, if only he hadn't gone in the water at that one moment, if only. So uh, stay. when I say decoupling, what I mean is that we can get very present with that and then we can, and then we can fully be with grief. And so I would say the other side is I do meet other, especially, I'm sorry, but like spiritual people who also will talk about death and dying as if it's just a just, you know, it's just whatever. It's just, you know, it's another thing that happens and we need to get comfortable. And I always think, well, you've clearly never experienced your own death. Like if you're saying that <laughs> you've never been there. So we need to be able to develop sort of these two parts of us where I can be that, yes, this death is really hard and it's really hard for you and it's natural. And I don't say that out loud. That's the other thing. That's nothing I say to someone else. That's what I, that's the, like the foundation that I stand on. That's how I stay solid. And now, um, being with someone's grief, um, it, it, I mean, that is hard. It, it gets easier, but it, it gets easier only because you know more what to do. I would say that, you know, more what to say, you know, more how to be with someone. Um, and, uh, right now, for example, I'm working with someone who's an extremely traumatic, complicated grief and my ability to be with that person is, is, does come from experience. Um, and at the same time, it's not like, um, I guess I'm trying to like separate out, like it's not hard because I know what to do, but I don't want to, nor would I ever want to train someone else that it's like, oh no, that's easy. No, like no big deal. Like holding someone else's like profound 
agonizing pain um, is no small feat, right? And so we need to then have tools um, about that and ways to take care of ourselves, ways to process it later, ways to prepare ourselves before we're entering into that space. Um, and more than anything, really recognizing from the, from the very beginning that there is absolutely nothing I can do to stop your suffering. And so that, um, I mean, that comes from one, we could say it comes from our yoga practice too, that I have to get really comfortable with that, that this is the fire this person has to walk through. And that if I can alleviate their suffering by being, you know, someone walking along with them, then that's great. But I have to let go that I'm going to stop it. It can't stop. And it shouldn't stop. It shouldn't be yeah. halted. Grief has to have its process. It has to go through. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to have grief without suffering? I feel like I've heard a teacher talk about how pain and suffering are kind of two separate things. And the suffering is something that happens as a response to pain. So if something really terrible happens, it's not the fact that you're grieving, but there does get all these extra narratives added on about kind of like, as you said, like it shouldn't have happened this way. This isn't right. And like, that's where the suffering actually is. It's not as much the raw data of what happened. Is that something you agree with? Or do you think that it's... No, I don't agree with that in this case. I, I totally understand the paradigm of pain and suffering, and I teach the paradigm of pain and suffering and how we can separate those things out and that we do create suffering around things that don't, that, that yeah, that it's really the pain and the narrative is what creates the suffering. Um, so I, I completely understand that that paradigm, and I do teach it. And I would say in this case, no, because the suffering, the suffering is the pain. The suffering is the pain. So yeah, there are things that will complicate it further. Uh, like, yeah, questions about manner of death. Um, often one of the things I teach in my trainings that I really learned from my own experience is that anyone who is grieving the loss of a loved one, particularly if it's a family member, you, one of the things you can always ask them, what else is happening in the family structure that is causing you to suffer? And that is compounding your grief. And I'll tell you, there's always going to be something. There's always, it was the death of my sister and it was also the way my parents reacted. It was the, the and it was also this. So, so there are things that compound that suffering. Um, but grief, I mean, grief is suffering. Grief, grief is to suffer. So I, I don't think, um, yeah. So I don't think that one, it really fits for this. I don't think that, um, we can relieve those things. It's, it's time. Yeah. It's time and integration. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody who is actively grieving right now, who might not be really totally connected to a yogic practice, who hasn't done a lot of internal work to have a very um, resilient container to move through this. If somebody is just hearing this and, they're going through something like what for like the lay person can they take away from this to maybe console or get direction or like what would be like the the most pithy instruction if you will call me <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um that'd be the most pithy instruction no I, I mean a couple of things that i would say are to to a person in in grief um is one you're, you, you deserve, you're, you're allowed your grief. You're allowed your grief and, and the whole narrative around the world and everybody around you telling you that you shouldn't, or you'll get over it or whatever, like just shut that all out. Like grief, you're in it and you just be in it. There's nothing that you can, um, yeah, we, a, a lot of times grieving is also complicated by the fact that we think we shouldn't be grieving anymore or we're not grieving correctly. Or if I had a yoga practice, I'd just be meditating or something. Um, and you know, the, the grief just is going to have its own trajectory. So that's one thing I would say. Another thing I would say, honestly, especially if it's loss of a family or a, a, someone close to you, but a death, but really anything, I think also the instruction, honestly, and I learned this more after my brother's death is, and I, I, I'm not, I, like I'm totally saying this in all serious, 
Stay home for as long as you possibly can. Isolate yourself for as long as you can. Um, and when I say isolate, I mean call upon people who love you. Call upon people that you trust. Ask people to come over. Ask people to sit with you. Um, maybe go to someone's house if like that feels really good to you and it's just going to be you and them or something like that. But I don't think people necessarily understand how tender and raw people are in that state of grief. And we try to go out or we invite people out or we say, well, wouldn't it be good for you to be around people? And usually it's not, it's really hard. Um, and so that is a new thing that I've been saying to people, stay alone at home as long as you possibly can. And then I say, it's like um, Groundhog Day. Like you, then you go out and you check it out and you do one little bit of socializing and you tell yourself like that worked or it didn't. Like, I think I'm ready. Or you go, nope, it's going to be another two weeks. So I'm going to shut my door and go back home. Um, so that, that was really helpful to me. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the grace to be able to say, I'm just staying home. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not um, seeing anybody again, except for people who I felt really close to. Um, so that, and then the other thing I would say is that, um, I mean, there are lots of little tiny things. Like I would say, like put um, essential oils on your hands and smell them a lot. Like just keep oils in your pocket or your purse or whatever and just keep smelling them. Um, I have a lot of like little tips and tricks to just kind of make it through the day. Um, so I could offer more of those, but that I would also say is that like you will, it will get better. It will change. And so I would even say to anyone who might be listening to this or watching this when you were like, it's so great. Like you're here and talking and teaching and, um, and it is, and, and, and that's what I do. And at the same time, there's two pieces that I would want people to know from looking at that, looking at me that three months ago when people were saying to me, can I help you? What do you need? Um, and I'm not even sure why I was saying this, but what I responded to people a lot, is, I don't know why I was saying, but I, I was saying, I just want to be swallowed by the earth. I just want to be swallowed by the earth. I just don't, I just don't want to go on. Like, no, I don't care. Like I, I can't imagine this pain ever alleviating and I can't imagine anyone connecting with me on it. No one can understand my pain. And so what I want someone to, would want them to know is that this is now, well, I guess now almost four months later and, um, I'm walking, talking, eating, swimming, socializing, working, you know, enjoying life. Um, and, and I still cry. Like I cry almost probably not every day, but probably every other day. <laughs> um, but, but it, so, so like you'll get out of it. Like, so just, it's okay. Like that dark, dark, dark place, just like hang in there. You will get out of that dark place and then you will experience your grief in a different way. And it will be a different kind of grief that's manageable. So it's going to stay with you forever, but this, what you're experiencing right now is not, will not. It's, it's not, it, it's unsustainable and everyone before us has gone through this, right? And I guess I can only say that because I'm in this, I've been talking a lot about like, I'm not that special. Like I can tend to my own grief and I can be with my own family and I, and I have to. And it also is helpful for me to remember that lots of people have lost two siblings or so lots of people have lost a, a baby. Lots of people have lost a child. Lots of people have lost a parent. And we look at people in wartime all over, like they're all losing people. That doesn't make your grief less. And, and again, like whoever's listening, you're like, take it from me. I'm not like bullshitting you like yoga teacher. I'm saying this from my own really fresh, direct experience. Um, that it's the both and that your grief is so real and it's your own. But if we can also remember that everyone, like so many people have, they've done this, they've done this so we can do it too. We can get through this because mm. other people have gotten through it. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To me, it's always seemed like going through a traumatic experience and, you know, this isn't something to like say to somebody, but like when you experience something like that, it really opens your heart to the other people of the world who are experiencing similar things. 
And I recently had this experience. Um, I had a concussion. I fell and bonked my head. And I have had a pretty clean bill of health. So I'm not trying to be like, oh, woe is me. But, you know, going to the hospital and like going through this whole period of uncertainty, like, is my brain bleeding? Like, I, I'm really not in an okay place. And after having never really done that, it, I think, is also what led me to this, like, realization of wanting to get more involved with, like, the hospice situation because it was, like, that feeling of uncertainty and just being alone in this sterile place, it connected me a little bit to just everybody who's in that situation. And I realized how much I don't have, like, there's so much grace that comes from the things that befall us. And do you, do you agree that, you know, moving through stuff like this has an ability to bring you closer to the world, closer to the quality of aliveness that we all kind of like want? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and I actually think that that's really true of most any trauma, um, that we endure in our lifetime and that it's one of the ways we can transform our trauma is to let it be an opening to what other people's experiences are and um, other people's processes and why people are the way they are and why they react the way they react. And um, outside of just death and dying, I, I just have worked extensively with trauma and specifically excuse me, childhood sexual trauma. And one of the things I often hear from people is that, and, and I agree too, is that um, if I were to look back at my life as like frame, 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 then there's lots of things we would edit out. Like we would never choose those traumas again, ever, uh, obviously. And that at the same time, for most people that I've ever worked with, if we look at our whole life just as a gestalt, and now here I am, then there's this quality of that I wouldn't I wouldn't not have any of those things because all of those things have brought me to be the space that I am now. And so, for example, like what I just said to you, I mean, I, um, I mean, I was recently at a Tema Scala, we call it like a sweat lodge, and I shared something about um, you know losing my siblings and my family just getting smaller or something, and you know the nice hippie guy that was running the Tema Scala. I mean, that might be mean, but anyway, it was like you know, started in on like, well, yes, you know, we have to become friends with death. And that's one of the things we do. And it was, again, one of my friends that came out of that and said, well, clearly that person has never experienced death. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think you're right. It's like when we say those kinds of things, especially if we call ourselves healer in somewhat kinds of ways, to me, even those kinds of statements are the indicator that obviously you've never been through that. Whereas it, when once we've been through something, we have, and, and it's not that just because I've been through something makes me an expert on it. That's really important. That's really important too. And we actually talk about that a lot in the, our bedside yoga training. Um, but at the same time, it does give me a different awareness of, of where people are coming from and how to respond to them. And, um, and I think generally speaking, we're a lot more spacious. We're a lot more understanding. We're a lot more sort of non-dualistic. And we're much less likely to try to like Pollyanna it or just tie it up with a bow or spiritual bypass or whatever you might want to call it, you know, just like shine it up, right? That we can actually just sit with like, that's awful. <laughs> yeah. And I'm with you. Yeah. The, the texture quality that I've noticed as I've gotten really into meditation and I also do yoga and I'm really exploring the matters of the heart. You know, a lot of people on the outside, I think, have this really like light view, like, oh, they're really compassionate. And, you know, like they do like good things for people. And there's kind of like a separation of like what that experience actually is. And I'm, again, not saying that I'm very far on this path or anything, but it, the way that it feels like the budding of compassion is this really tender, almost kind of like a sad sensation. And this is kind of what my root teacher, Chogyam Trumpa, talks about is like the tender heart of sadness of when you really make contact with the world it's not necessarily this like blissful nirvana kind of thing everybody has it's this more melancholy but uplifted it's just this really really rich and it, it's just not what i thought it would be <laughs> you 
No. Yeah, I think that's a lot of, um, I think that's a big, especially in yoga, I think especially in yoga, it's a big thing that we get really, really wrong. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the teaching, uh, the way teachings are disseminated, especially like I can speak of in the United States. Um, so we, we are often, we hear people talking in those kinds of ways that, um, you know, something like yoga, it's like, it's about, you know, looking at the positive or looking at the light or seeing what's good or, and that if you became more, um, you know, you became more yogic, you'd be more just like happy or something like that. And, um, and I mean, boy, did we ever get that wrong? I mean, like, look at the Bhagavad Gita, like what's the big reveal, right? The big reveal when Krishna reveals himself to Arjuna, you know, at first he's saying like, you do not want to see this <laughs> because what you think is God presence is not, you're going to see everything. And then when he reveals himself, right, it's just, it's this whole cacophony of, of horrible things and wonderful things and lovely things. And, and Arjuna is like, stop, stop, you know, I don't want to see it anymore. Right. But, um, that that's the reality of what, what life is. And so that a yoga practice, a meditation practice is actually us leaning into the totality of something, not picking and choosing. Right. And, um, what I often say too, especially like to yoga people is that when we idealize something and we only want to look at one side of it and we think that's loving, like that's not loving. To love something, um, including life, um, to love something is to love the totality of it, the wholeness of it. And the wholeness of life, I mean, the Buddhists got this part, right? I know it, it, if people don't understand it, as, you know, I didn't when I was a lot younger, the whole idea of like life is suffering, right? You're like, oh, who wants to go on that path, right? <laughs> but like, you know, now at the ripe old age of 55, like, yeah, my life has been chock full of happy things and wonderful things. Those aren't the things I need to practice on. Right. But no one's getting out of here without having to deal with the hardest things you could ever possibly imagine. And before even they're happening to you, like you said, they're happening all around the world. And so when we just want to close our eyes and our ears, especially in like sort of the service of being more spiritual or a spiritual practice, we are completely missing the mark. And, and, and you're right that, that it's the, it's the challenging places that often, as you use the word tenderness, ha have the most to teach us in terms of, of tenderness and connection. Yeah. Yeah, I, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I think it was Ram Dass that talks about how he was with the stroke and he would say, um, I don't wish the stroke upon anybody, but I would wish the grace that the stroke gave me for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really is like a really nice quote that encapsulates that energy really exactly. well. Exactly. That's a great way to yeah. put it. Good old Ram Dass. Yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah. So, so good. I'm curious with, with you bringing up the, the, the path of yoga, um, when I, I, I just talked to my roommate about this conversation and I kind of explained what you do and I'm like, yeah, bedside yoga. And she's like, how are people who are actively dying, how are they doing yoga? her understanding of it is also primarily asana based as well. So how, how do you bring the world of yoga to people who are in this space? Like how, what does that look like? Yeah. So let's see, I'd say there's like at least like two ways that we could look at it. So one is, as you just touched on, we have to define what we mean by yoga. So that's the first thing, right? So really, um, like, am I bringing people yoga asana? Am I getting people up out of bed and having them doing sun salutations? Like, I'm, you know, is that what it is? And are they doing lying down? Are they doing restorative poses? Yeah, they might be doing any of that or they might be doing none of that, right? So um, maybe yoga is the asana. Maybe the yoga that we're bringing as bedside yoga is a perspective or maybe the yoga that we're bringing, if I'm thinking really like staying in the tools part, like maybe it's visualizations, maybe it's um, mantra, maybe, so it's, maybe it's those kinds of things. So that would be one way I think is that we have to expand what we're thinking of with yoga. But I would say the other part, and, and what I do a lot of teaching in my, in my trainings, 
is really, it's, it's recognizing that the yoga is in you. All right, so when you're doing bedside yoga, you're bringing yoga to someone, you're bringing you to someone and your presence and the work that you've done and the fruits of your practice and your capacity for spaciousness and your capacity for multidimensional thinking and your capacity for creativity and all of those kinds of things, that's what you're bringing. And really that's the yoga so that what your work might look like. So a couple of things that might be surprising to people is if you want end of life care to be your primary work, it might be one of the only things that you would see a condition that you would see that your client, see whoever your client is, might be the person you see the least, right? So if you decide you want to do an end of life care program with someone and you're, you're hired for that death doula, whatever you want to call it. Um, and let's say you go in every Thursday at two, it's very possible that every single Thursday you go in, they're sleeping, they're eating, they're too nauseous, they're, they have someone visiting. So it's one of the only conditions that everything is just like, it's all on their time. And you don't get to be like, oh, you're a friend that just came, you know, from Michigan to visit. Well, now I'm here. So you need to move over to the side. Like that's never going to happen. <laughs> right. So that's that's one thing that I think is um, important for people to understand so that now your client, so to speak, actually is really the whole system everyone that is surrounding that person. So it's the family, it's the loved ones. It might even be the medical staff, right? So it's all of that. So, so that's one thing who it's, it's what's in me and then what I'm bringing to the other person. And, and I might not actually see that other person very much. And then also what I'm bringing then could actually end up looking like, and again, a lot of this is what it's going to look like. You're like, I'm going to, I'm the yoga person. I'm going to come in and I'm going to do yoga with you. I and mean, we would never say that anyway, but what you end up doing is you're like cleaning out the person's refrigerator and you're dating the date of everything in that refrigerator. You're throwing away everything, you know, that's nasty or freezing things and you're setting people's Tupperwares out. Right. And that might be the hour that you spend with someone doing bedside yoga. Right. So then it doesn't become this whole thing like, well, everything's yoga. That's yoga, too. It becomes, well, I don't know that that's yoga per se. But what I do know is that from the perspective I come here to serve, then whatever I'm doing, I'm in that service for me. So uh, so two other little things I would say about that. One is if you mentioned Ramdas and then I showed you my Hanuman statue. One thing is I would um also think about that um, that quote between Hanuman and Ram, where Hanuman says, Ram says, who are you? And Hanuman says, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you, right? That's so beautiful. And so that, for me in bedside yoga, that's part of what we're bringing to. So we're bringing this idea of service, but we're also turning it on its head. Like we know that we're coming in service, but then we also have to let go of the ego of service, right? I'm just here because I'm like you, like the, the truly compassion, fellow feeling, suffering with. I'm here to be present to you. And it's also making me think um, about, so I have, I've been on uh, four personal retreats with Ram Dass, so I get to like name drop Ram Dass. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so one time Ram Dass said to me, he said, Molly, I wrote this book called, um, How Can I Help You? And he said, if I could rewrite that book, I would call it, How Can You Help Me? And he used to love to make that joke. And so really what he was saying again is turning the idea of service around, right? Um, so, um, really that I, I am, I am coming from this place of, it's this mutuality. It's a mutuality that's being experienced. Um, and then I had another thought cause I said there were two and now I forgot the other one. I'm sure it'll come back to me. It reminds me of the, I think, I think you'd call it a metaphor, but Roshi Joan Halifax says about compassion where it, the nature of it is if the right hand itches, the left hand scratches it. And that sense that it is kind of this just simultaneous arising of things. It's not like a premeditated, like it comes from a space of like emptiness. So you, you're you not carrying this idea of like, I'm the person who's serving. And the more of that that there is, the less um, 
spontaneous and natural the actual interaction is. I'm kind of curious, and this is something that I've really wanted to check within myself as I acknowledge like the budding interest in this line of work is, is there a way to, and this might sound really bad, but to treat this in a really spiritually materialistic way to where it's like, I'm a spiritual person. So I clearly have to go into this line of work that I've heard these other spiritual people talk about, like, how can you really make sure that you are in the right heart space as you get into this work? Or if it's like coming from a contrived place, does that happen? I mean, is that, I, I feel like yeah. I see it. What I would say is that if you hear yourself or someone else saying, I'm a spiritual person, therefore already like huge red flag, right? Already like, um, what, so you are a, you are a a meditation teacher in a Buddhist tradition. And so there, there, I live in a very small little town here, a teeny, teeny town. And there's a couple other people who are also foreigner people from the States. And I have this like you know, spiritual center, or whatever. I just call it a meditation center. And I'm thinking about this one fellow down here that people keep saying, so-and-so wants to teach at your space. He's a Dharma teacher. And I'll say, well, what is he? Get? He's a Dharma teacher. That's what they keep saying. And finally, I'm like, yeah, I'm not interested. Like, so just the fact, A, that this person's not asking me directly, but also that you're a Dharma teacher. Like, what does that even mean? It just sounds to me so ego-y and that like, oh, and, and now, so you're going to go teach us the Dharma? Like, so I don't know. So I think as soon as we're coming from that place, we've, we've got it wrong. And so, um, and so maybe that was the other piece that I was going to say is that a, a big part of my training is um, we spend a lot of time, actually the whole first, I call them like units, the whole first unit, we're not even talking about death and dying too much. We're talking about us and who we are and how do we get our egos under control so that when I show up to someone, I don't need them to know anything. I don't need to be the yoga therapist, the yoga teacher, the meditation teacher, the, I I don't need to be anything, anything at all. And then from that place I can say, and I do have these tools that I can offer, but even if you don't want any of my tools, then okay, then I've, other things I can offer with that. I can clean out your refrigerator, right? And then I don't have any sense of like diminishment or need or control or anything like that. Um, the other thing is that I have, yeah, I've seen a lot of what you're talking about. Uh, people get really surprised too in the training. Um, I mean, not everybody, but that they want to talk about what they're going to teach someone. And I'm thinking, what on, you know, if someone's in their last months, weeks, days, hours of their life, you really think they want you teaching them? Like, what do you teach them? Teach them about the Bhagavad Gita? Teach that, like, first of all, you're talking about stuff that you don't even know your own self about, right? Like, this person's actually dying and you want to, like, you know, reflect a scripture from the Bhagavad Gita. But um, it's also just not the place people are in. Or, like, you, you know, lots of times this is surprising people. People say, well, how about pranayama? And I'll say, well, how about it? you right. People don't, they're not interested in learning something new right now. And lots of times the breath is exactly what's causing fear and compromise. And for me to think I'm going to go in and like teach you some naughty shodana or something like that's all, that's all me. That's not me really thinking about you. Um, and so I, I think that there. Yeah, that's what I would say is I I would know that this work isn't for me if I started by saying, I want to go in and work with people because I want to teach them yoga. I think people are in it because I want to teach them meditation, you know, whatever it is. It should really be maybe I have recognized a need that people uh, need support in the death process because it's really hard. And we've come to figure out that people need support in the birth process because it's really hard and it's complicated and there's all these different moving pieces. So we have things like birth doulas. So if I'm really coming from that place and saying, I'm recognizing this need and I would like to be able to, you know, somehow be of service in that need and then allow myself to say that the service can look like whatever the need actually is. I can't come with any agenda. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of gets me thinking about the beginning of this conversation where you said that you were working in the clinical setting and you kind of recognized that there was like a lack of something that you wanted to respond with 
bringing in your more yogic background and kind of a more holistic understanding. What do you think it is about the clinical setting that might have that sense of lack that you think that they can maybe like work a little bit on and maybe make more holistic in that sense? Do you, is, is it something that we should even be asking of clinical settings or is there anything uh, really apparent that kind of jumps out to you that needs some work? Yes. And um, so I want to just caveat and and back up just a little bit. Um, The yoga world specifically loves a duality of the Western docs versus the Eastern docs and the clinical setting versus the yoga setting and that all of this, right? And natural medicine versus allopathic medicine. So I would say first and foremost, as a yoga practitioner, as a person who has worked in a clinical setting, um, and as a pretty sharp person, (laughs) I would say, uh, those are false dichotomies that are creating more division and um, diminishing people's work and diminishing entire demographics of people as if every doctor doesn't know what they're doing, as if every nurse isn't compassionate, as if every clinical hospital setting is meant, you know, out to get you. And it's just wrong. It's just, it's not right. It's not right morally. And it's, it's not right factually. Um, and lots of yoga people can do all kinds of damage. And I've seen lots of damage done by yoga people. I've seen lots of harm be done to me and things that other yoga people have said to me during different times of trial or loss. So first, I just want to really, before I respond to that, I just want to really make clear that I do not buy into that dichotomy. So I, I couldn't say that, you know, clinical settings are like this. Okay. So I just want to say also that the massage therapy world is the same way. Yeah. There's a lot of people who they think that they're like the enemy, even though it's like, we're all serving the same function of ease and health. And exactly. so I just want to say you are not alone in that experience. Yeah, I'm sure. And I think that's one of the pitfalls of any of like sort of the alternative healing arts that we have to we have to stay attuned to because what are we doing then we're just creating different divisions we're just creating you know we think we're like so holier than now but we're just creating a whole other way of disconnection and, and we're responsible for it and we're generating it yeah so but okay so but that being said um um i think i think just oftentimes in a clinical setting and, I, and I'm going to talk when people are doing their best because there's lots of fantastic clinical settings. There's no other place I'd want to be than a clinical setting. But I would say the entire structure of healthcare is such that people are overworked. They don't always have time to do the kind of work they need to do. Um, I mean, one of my private therapy clients is a social worker in an ER. And then she comes to see me because the structure is not set up to support them in any of their secondary trauma, compassion, fatigue, any of that, right? So you have these amazing people just being worked and worked and worked and worked with no, no one else supporting them. Um, and so sometimes if we can come in and alleviate any of that or, or provide um, a space where, some, where somebody else in the clinical setting can either feel inspired or like seen, you know, that we're the one that says to a nurse, like, oh my God, that was the best thing you did. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. How did you do that? I never would have thought of that, right? Then the person is reminded that, okay, this is important work, right? So, um, so I think it's a lot of time, it's just, it's time and support, Um, And then I would also say that in my training, the only required reading is um, a book by Atul Gawande called Being Mortal. And while I say to my students, there's like the the list of books you could read about death and dying are, you know, endless. And certainly like in the sort of spiritual realm, they're, they're endless. Why I choose this particular book is because he talks about, first of all, how we came to have like skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, what those were all intended for, what they have turned into. And he also speaks a lot about the way that we collectively regard life and death 
in American culture. And, and particularly then, uh, so what happens in a hospital culture gets seeped down into most lay people's experience of, um, like I'm in a medical emergency and a doctor, whoever tells me what to do, then, then I'm mostly, we just do that. Right. And so that's kind of our conditioning. So we have more voices around us telling us that. And so as an example, one of the things that we do, especially in the United States is that we prioritize keeping a person alive over everything else. So just keep them alive, keep them alive, try another heroic measure, um, you know, spend more money, try another test. And we don't often just admit defeat here, you know, and it's not even defeat, admit reality, like it's okay. And it's okay to let go. And so I would say that the clinical setting, um, like it's part of that machine. So even though there might be lots of people within there, that that is not how they feel. The machine itself is saying, well, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. And that's part of what gets missed. And so people often miss the, the opportunity to have their own agency, be like, I just don't want to do that. Or to make it okay to say, I just would rather die. Um, I don't want to try that other round of chemo. Um, families to take their loved one home, right? So even though, again, there's plenty of individuals within the work that would be supportive of that, the system itself is built. It's a, it's a you know, it's a capitalist system. It's built on keeping you in the system. And I don't remember the exact um, statistic, but it's something like Americans spend 85% of their total wealth in the last five years of their life, something like that, right? Because it, it's all on medical intervention. Mm. So instead of just saying, well, I didn't even, it's okay. I didn't even think about that. Like that's kind of a, that's a weird thing. It makes me feel a little weird, you know, <laughs> you build up your whole life for that last little bit. And I'm really glad that you, yeah, at all costs. (laughs) Yeah. I'm glad you, you pointed out that it's more the system. I mean, I know a lot of healthcare workers who are, you know, in very clinical situations. They're all such lovely, beautiful people. My mom included, who is an RN at, um, I guess you'd call it like a retirement home. Um, they're not necessarily, it's not like a hospice type situation that are actively passing, but, um, you know, during COVID, she's definitely had that compassion fatigue. And we've talked a lot about um, she's just not getting any time with the residents. You know, they do their round of pills and then they, that's the only interaction that a lot of these people get, especially during COVID when they're quarantined. And I, just seeing the way that it like tears her heart up and you know, people who get involved with that line of work want to make those connections. They want to be there for people. But the way that the system works is they're so understaffed. They're so, the schedule is just so tight that there's just no human to human connection. And it almost kind of the way that she described it is like, it feels like you're at like a farm or something. Like it just doesn't feel like, like this is their home, you know? And it's like all these loving people who want to bring their presence, but are just not allowed to based on the requirements and the strapped staffing. And exactly, it, it, it's heart wrenching to mm-hmm. consider, mm-hmm. you know, And then I can't help but thinking to going back like in the massage world or the yoga world, like we're such nice, good people that are really ready to throw those people under the bus, (laughs) like as if they're not doing enough. Like, shouldn't it be if we were such nice, good people, shouldn't what you talked about be our first awareness and our desire to be supportive, right? And thank God they are doing that work. Do you want to do it? Do you want to work in a hospital all day, every day? (laughs) Like. You know, like, no, that's why I'm a yoga teacher. Okay, well, then you damn lucky someone else does, right? We should be lifting yeah. them up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been hard to watch just during the COVID thing, especially when, I mean, it was like worldwide, nationally, you know, just all of the short staffing and just seeing these videos of people working 70-hour weeks and they have to keep showing up. And, you know, at the time we were all like, yeah, go healthcare, but you know, outside of that, that we don't do any legislative change to make sure that they're actually taken care of. Exactly. You know, and it's, that's yeah. really how you show care is by. by really yes, exactly. By making yeah. real and legislative change, structural change. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking the other thing I wanted to add about when you were talking about like your roommate or other people who might be like, well, what would you do at the, at the end of uh, someone who was dying? And so I don't know if this was the other piece of what I was going to say, but I 
I do want to say it, is that um, also dying people look all different kinds of ways. And we don't know that because we don't see them because we're not in, in that work, right? And like you said in the beginning, because we don't talk about it, all of that. And so people can be dying and at the end of life and they're up and walking around, right? I mean, my sister was up in the morning of the day she died, the night she died. Um, I was still doing like Thai massage on her. I have done, I've worked a lot of, with a lot of people in the facility that I mentioned that they would get up out of bed and do little stretches and little movements and movement sequences or we can, I use a lot of Thai yoga techniques where I can do like passive stretching and moving of people. And I think one of the things that we can think about, again, it's not that we're like teaching people anything. It really is out of care. And I think that we can, most of us can probably relate to it. Um, I mean, I had COVID and probably other people on this call had COVID. Um, but even when we've had like a really bad flu or something and we're just in bed and we just feel awful and then our body starts to ache and like it aches because of the flu itself, but it also aches because we're just lying there in bed. The last thing we feel like doing is getting up and moving. But if we did or if we could or if someone could help us, then we could just lie back down in bed and we just feel a little better. We would still have the flu. We'd still have COVID or whatever. And I, I really thought about that a lot in COVID because I had it really bad. And the first like day or two that I could even get up, I immediately like put out a yoga mat and I just did like a few, you know, maybe like five minutes of just little stretches. It was the last thing I wanted to do, but I just then got got back in bed and continued watching, you know, binge watching Shit's Creek, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but my body felt relatively better, right? And so that's the other piece that if we do access the person who is at end of life, one of the reasons I wanted to bring in the movement piece is that I do realize how we really, we talk about death as a medical event to be managed, so we don't really talk or think that much about how to make a person feel the best they could possibly feel, even though they're not getting better. They're not going to not have that cancer. They're not going to not have the flu or whatever it is, right? So I can maybe convince a person, yeah, I can see that convinced, I mean, at least listeners, like everything I'm saying, take with a grain of salt, because I'm talking about like things in my mind that come from a ton of experience, right? So don't go into anyone's room and convince them of anything. Yeah. <laughs> but let's say I was in a conversation with someone and said, I can imagine how the last thing you would want to do is move. Um, what if we just did like five minutes, we set a timer, we did just five minutes, really, really gentle movement. And you can tell me, you can tell me how it ended up making you feel or how it's making you feel right then. And then you can decide whether you ever want to do that again. And uh, mostly anybody would end up saying, oh yeah, okay, that gave me that relief. I can actually sleep better. And we, in the in the facility that we started this program in Seattle in whatever, 2003, the nurses actually did their own overview of the patients that we were seeing and saw that uh, patients were sleeping through the night. They were needing less pain pills. They were experiencing less anxiety. Um, mainly they were having better pain control was the main thing that they were saying, and therefore they could sleep better. And really it just with, you know, a couple mo moments of very, very gentle, gentle movement. So that, that, that it, on the one hand, I said, it might be the person you never see. So the yoga is in you, but if we get all the way up to like, okay, so now we're going to do yoga with someone, we have to start to be able to imagine what a dying person could look like. And they're not all drifting in and out of consciousness. As a matter of fact, the woman who I mentioned, the, who I was at the schedule death, part of her day, she wanted her toenails painted. Then she wanted to do yoga. Then she wanted to put on this dress and get back into bed and begin the dying process. Right. So yeah. we have to be able to expand our minds both to what yoga looks like, but also what a dying person could look like. Yeah. And I think it's an important uh, highlight to talk about yoga in that way of like, it's not just for longevity. Like we don't just do yoga as a means to like maximize our life and our optimization, but it's about being completely more in the moment and alleviating just today, you know, and just like allowing it to just be for you right now. 
I think that that's, you know, divorcing it from like getting the yoga body and, you know, the spiritual enlightenment at the end of the tunnel, but just like to help with exactly where you are and just be where you are, you know, even if it's a 10% reduction in pain, that is pretty massive to somebody who is, you know, in that place. For sure. Completely change equality. And it's making me think of that. There's a quote by BKS Iyengar that Iyengar that says yoga is, um, something about yoga is something we can cure and to endure what cannot be cured, something like that. Right. So that second part about enduring what cannot be cured, that that's part of the practice of yoga too, is how do we endure things? Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. I've never heard that quote. Mm -hmm. I knew he had the chops, but yeah. 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 Well, we are at time. I want to give you a little bit before your next uh, endeavor. So Molly, thank you so Mm -hmm. much. Um, I have a tendency to just pick people's brains and just like, and yeah, this was really informative and I'm sure people are going to really enjoy hearing what you have to say. Um, I see you have a training coming up, right? I That's do. a thing. Yeah. So the you training, talk about it? sure. Um, the training starts on Tuesday, I think that's the 11th. 12th starts on Tuesday, April 12th. Uh, my end of life care trainings run for three months. Um, they are typically on a Tuesday evening, Thursday evening, and Sunday morning, but they keep they change over time. So it would be like one week a Tuesday and then the next week a Thursday like that. And so if people can't make any of those, like, oh, well, I can't be there on Thursdays, that's okay because the, the Thursdays are only going to come up every third time like that. Um, and we uh, all the, they're always recorded and um, and the students work together on a Google document where we we will have our sessions together on Zoom, and then they have these questions for consideration and they fill in a Google Doc and they have the benefit of each other's um, uh, insights and then we come back together and. Um, Yeah, we continue on and I divide it sort of into four parts. The first one is about faith foundations and then it's about what, what is our role? What are we doing? And then we, it's about logistics and practicalities. And then finally it's about movement and touch. Um, and then I suppose the last thing I'd say is that when you register, then you have access to a password protected page on my website so that once you finish the training, you have all of the recordings from the training, you have all of the Google docs and you have all of the endless and copious links and resources that I send you are all together in, in one page. Um, and I, I, like I said at the beginning, I mean, I don't, I'm not much of a self promoter, but now I've been doing this long enough and seeing it growing up in the yoga world. I really can't imagine a better person with the, um, from my clinical practice to my depth of knowledge in yoga, to my personal experience. Um, uh, if you're going to do this work, you should do it with me, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Plus that Ram Dass endorsement. That's that's a time-tested situation. Yeah, let me show you this, Brett. Let's see if you can see this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's you two. And me and Ron. No, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, was a, that was a weird day. Like That was before COVID. I remember showing up to my job at the time and getting that news. And the feeling that I had was it was like sad, but it was also, I mean, I've never met him, but he's been a part of my life for 10 years now. And I felt more connected to him than any other point. I was like, as soon as I like heard it, I was like, Oh, you're here right now. Like there was no separation, just the immediate kind of settling into, Oh, like that's a turning of a wheel for sure. And that's so cool. I'll send you a blog post. Actually, I did after one of my visits with him. Um, That's really about in a way when if Ramdas is in his body, then we have this desire to be with him. And we feel a sense of like disconnection because, oh, I can listen to his podcast. I read, but I just can't be with him. And then there is this thing that once like what he always says, when he drops his body, then all of a sudden it totally makes sense to me that you felt like you could access him more because it's not like limited to this. I can only access him if I can see him in this realm. Now I can see him everywhere. Yeah. Ramdas would love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I felt the same thing with Thich Nhat Hanh too, who recently passed, you know, there was even less of like a shock. I mean, obviously cause he was um, very 
uh, old, but it, it was almost just kind of like, I felt just, I felt like a, a small grain of his piece, you know, and it was just kind of like that dissemination. And I can't help but feel that that's everybody who passes, you know, like they don't really go anywhere, you know, they never came. They just kind of, it's just always there. Yeah. I actually, if, if I can, I'll just end with a really short little, there's an adage that's attributed to Ramana Maharshi and it was when he was dying and all, and his students are all around him and they're crying and wailing and please don't go. And just his answer to them is, is where would I go? Where could I go? And so, um, yeah. Um, and, and, and then at the same time, I said it was the last thing, but I would say the same time we've talked a lot about spiritual bypass. If we, those are things that are good for us in our practice, but if we were actually working with another person, for example, who was in acute grief, they don't want to hear that. That's not true. So it, it, we have to be able to have the both. And like, I could say like, that's true for my sister, Erin now, three years later. But for my little brother, I don't feel that. I just want him, his body, right? So we also, when the, the, that's part of our art, when we said, how would I know I should do this work or not do this work, is our ability also to know what, like, timings of things, that things can be true, but the timing of when we say them makes a huge difference. And so we have to know that we have some skill and capacity with that. <laughs> wow, that is... Very good. Yeah, I think that's what we should put a, use it as a bow to wrap on this. Awesome. Molly, thank you so much. Um, you, where sir. can people find you? How can they, I know you have your course. Do you have other things people can access or? Yeah, or you can you go on my website. It's just my name, mollylandonkenny.org. Um, the main things that are always on there, I live down here in beautiful coastal Mexico. So I do personal retreats. I do grief retreats, which are really special. Um, and then I always do ongoing every three months, a new bedside yoga training. And then, um, I just, I do, I work a lot in Christian mysticism and sort of interfaith mysticism. And so every once in a while I get a little bee in my bonnet and I stick a course on there. That's about something super random. I, I usually don't teach things that any other yoga teachers are teaching. So I would say just, yeah, go on my current offerings and see what's up. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Seriously, you, this is really, really great. Oh, I'm so happy. Thanks for thinking of me. All right. That is the episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way through till the end. I really appreciate it. I'm sure Molly appreciates it. If you want to keep in touch with what she has going on and you're interested in that training, head on over to mollylandonkenny.org. All of those links are going to be in all the descriptions wherever you see this. They are down there. Uh, if you want to support the show, head on over to Patreon dot com slash 21st century vitalism the financial donation is the best thing that you could help <laughs> to do with this so i'd really really appreciate it check out some prior episodes share this with some friends whatever you can do to get the word out there we're having this conversation for you and your community that's what we're here to do so i hope you enjoyed it i will see you in a couple weeks